Now in a change of program this evening, George W. Bush gives an exclusive interview for the Tonight program. Good evening from Washington for this special edition of the Tonight program. I'm here at the White House for an exclusive interview with the President of the United States, George W. Bush, his first since the attacks on America on September the 11th. The President speaks to our program at a pivotal moment. In the Middle East, Palestinian suicide bombers and Israeli tanks and guns threaten to plunge the region into all-out war. With more British troops heading for Afghanistan, it's a critical moment too for the war and terror. And with Mr. Blair's latest visit to the United States for talks with the American president is an attack on Iraq, next on the agenda. President Bush spoke to me just hours after his dramatic announcement yesterday that his Secretary of State Colin Powell would be going to the Middle East to try to pull the region back from the brink of war. Mr. President, the situation in the Middle East is desperate beyond words. How far are you prepared to go to resolve the crisis? Well, today I gave a speech uh, which shows my uh, resolve to work with all parties concerned to try to achieve a lasting peace. On the one hand, I called upon uh, the Arab world to uh, fight terror, to cut off their money, to stop this business about glorifying suicide bombers by calling them martyrs, to make sure that the press didn't uh, encourage uh, violence and killing and murder. Uh, and on the other hand, I I said, uh, uh, Israel has a right to defend herself. I fully understand that. But that uh, it's time for her to withdraw from the occupied territory. And the reason I feel that way is that I began to worry that the foundations uh, necessary to achieve lasting peace were becoming eroded. In order for Israel to be able to exist, it requires the Arab world's willingness to work to, uh, to encourage the conditions uh, so that she can exist. And in order for there to be a Palestinian state, which I support, there needs to be the conditions so that a Palestinian state can exist. And those conditions were becoming eroded, so we acted strong. I'm sending our uh, very capable Secretary of State, Colin Powell, to the region. He goes there with the mandate of working with the leadership in that part of the world, as well as with the European Union and others to implement what's the UN resolution recent UN Resolution 1042, which lays out the steps necessary to eventually get to a political solution. But hasn't this come a little late, Mr. President? The Secretary of State has been there before. Uh, the Vice President well, has been in the region. You've had uh, General my Zinni there. Isn't I thought my speech came right about the right time. But for, for so long now, for many, many days, if not weeks, people could see this situation spiraling rapidly out of control. Well, the problem is you can't see the killers. You can't see the suicide bombers. And what we're trying to do is to, is to rally the world to expose them and to expose those who are funding them and to ex say to Iran, stop it. And to Syria, you must choose. That's the problem, the invisible part of everything that you thought you could see, you can't see. But what which is killers who are going into Passover type celebrations and killing people, killing innocent people. And uh, we've got to stop that. Trevor, we just have to. In order for there to be peace, there must be. There must be a world effort to stop the suicide and the killers. Those people kill for one reason, to stop the peace, to stop a plan from coming into effect. And, um, but, you know, so this silly notion about somehow our government hadn't been involved is just silly. I mean, we've been, we've had Zinni there, as you said, the vice president's there. The, the Secretary of State has been there in the past. He's going back. So what would be different this time? In his well, visit? this time, it's, uh, hopefully there's a, there's a resolve. Hopefully there's a, you know, there's a result of the needless killing and the loss of innocent life that responsible citizens stand up and say enough is enough. That's what I said today. Enough is enough. And I believe that, i tell you something else is different. Uh, Crown Prince Abdullah of Saudi Arabia 
laid out his initiative that essentially says the Arab world must recognize Israel's right to exist, which was a significant change, and we've got to seize on that bold initiative. Will Secretary of State Colin Powell meet Yasser Arafat? I have no idea yet. I tell you what he is going to do, he's going to go work with leadership to bring people together. My worry is, is that Yasser Arafat can't perform. He's been given plenty of opportunities. Has he forfeited your trust? He certainly hadn't earned it. I mean, here's a man who said that he has signed on at Oslo, that he was going to fight off terror. Uh, we, had a, we thought we had a ceasefire arranged. We're that close to a ceasefire. And next thing we know, there's a suicide bomber that, that hits. We thought a couple of months ago that we thought we had an agreement. Next thing we know, he's ordered a shipment of arms from Iran. Now, he's, he's got a long way to go. You come and, it, it start, and, it starts, and it starts with him proving that he can lead. He has let his people down. Now, there are others in the regions who can lead, and those I've called upon those others in the region to lead. And Crown Prince Abdullah of Saudi Arabia is taking a leadership role. President Mubarak of Egypt is a leader. King Abdullah of Jordan is a leader. And so Colin Powell is going to go to region to, uh, to gather those leaders up and to start a process, hopefully, that will lead to lasting peace. You come pretty close to suggesting that the Palestinians should look for another leader. It's up to them. You know, far be it from the American president to get to decide who leads what country. I'm just telling you, since I've been the president, the man hadn't performed. Is there an emerging difference between the United States and Britain about how this should be solved? The, the, no, the, because, I don't think well, so. let me tell you, the British Foreign Secretary Jack Straw says sending in tanks to Ramallah and to Bethlehem is no response to suicide yeah. bombers. You seem well, to imply that anything should be done to counter terrorism. No, actually, that's the difference. Well, and it's a significant I, one. I think I just told you that I asked for the uh, for Israel to uh, withdraw the cities that we sh which she now occupies. Uh, so the extent that um, uh, that if that's what the foreign secretary says, that's fine. I don't. I, I, the man I talked to is Tony Blair, and I talked to him this morning, and informed him about what I was going to say, and. Um, I gave him, he was the first foreign leader, by the way, I called uh, to detail the, uh, the speech that I delivered at 11 o'clock here in the U.S. And, and uh, he was, one, appreciative of the phone call, it seemed like, and two, uh, you know, uh, applauded what was going to be in the speech. He thought, of, at least, I, I hate to put words in somebody else's mouth, but it, from my perspective, but he thought he it's was about pleased. time. Did he, did he, did he oh, hint that? Know, those are your words, not his. Mr. President, to really put your stamp on a solution in the Middle East which will uh, help help you in other ways in fighting this war against terror as, right. as you yourself have said might you be willing to convene a summit to get the both sides together and to and to discuss these problems and to try to resolve these well we've tried summits in the past as you may remember it wasn't one all that long ago where um, where a summit was called and nothing happened and as a result we had a significant infatata in the area and uh, uh, the only time that's appropriate for a U.S. president to call a summit when it looks like something can get done. And in the meantime, the Secretary of State is very much involved in the Middle East. And, and I don't know if you want to call it a summit, but he's going to have meetings with leaders uh, attempting to get in place Resolution 1042, which the world, uh, the Security Council has agreed to, which will lead to a political settlement if all the parties participate. Mr. President, turning to the war on terror, which you declared in the aftermath of the events of September 11, hasn't it reached something of a stalemate? <laughs> Is that a serious question? I meant it as a serious question. Well, it's one. not. Well, no, of course we haven't had a stalemate. We're winning. I mean, we've just arrested a guy named Abu Zubaydah. Uh, we crushed the Taliban. They're no longer in office. We've got schools open for the first time uh... in uh, afghanistan where gir girls are going for the first time young girls are going to school no it's been a, it's been a it's been a it's been a glorious series of victories thanks to uh, friends such as the such as the british and um, I, <laughs> we got a lot more work to do don't get me wrong but i don't think there's any stalemate to it at your request the british are sending seventeen hundred more troops to afghanistan is there a danger that they might become sucked into a never-ending commitment no no it's not because we've got a plan on how to get out but first things first we've got to find those al-qaeda killers and bring them to justice what the world needs to know is there's still a lot of these uh, murderers on the loose and they're, and they're not that's what they are and anybody who thinks that they're uh, uh, you know that they're can, that we can rehabilitate them 
just simply doesn't know the nature of the enemy. And their leaders still on the loose, too. Well, there's one less on the loose. And we don't know if Mr. Bin Laden is on the loose. I don't know if you know, but I hadn't heard from him in well, a while. Well, I was hoping you'd, uh, hoping you'd tell us well, what, <laughs> what you think. Is, is, is Bin Laden around? I have no, is he alive? I have no idea, but I'll tell you this. Uh, he is, uh, he, he's not making a lot of noise these days. And uh, maybe he's dug in one of those holes, but they're not a hole deep enough. We're going to get him if he's still alive. And uh, these people are killers, and that's the way we're going to treat them. They're international crooks, and we're going to hunt them down one by one. I know there's a certain kind of anxiety amongst people in the press, for example. They want this thing over with tomorrow. But that's not the nature of this war. This is a different kind of war. This is a war that requires incredible patience and a resolve. And make no mistake about it, I've got the patience and the resolve necessary to win. And so does my country. We're united in this effort, and we're going to do whatever it takes to rout out these terrorist organizations. After the break, is war on Iraq next? And an extraordinary trip around the White House, led by the president himself. I know a lot of my fellow Americans have asked, you know, what can we do to help fight on the war against terror? And I answer by saying, love somebody. Would you call yourself adventurous? Perhaps you're just not aware that you live in one of the most inhospitable places on Earth, where people fight over parking spaces, and idiots cross without warning. A place where you must edge out gradually, keep your distance, and offer up prayers to the god of traffic lights. Please stay green. Please stay green. Of course you're adventurous. You just happen to live in Orpington, that's all. Welcome back to this special edition of The Tonight Program from Washington. President Bush has been talking again about escalating the war on terror. And first in his sights, apparently, is President Saddam Hussein. Mr. Bush accuses the Iraqi dictator of developing weapons of mass destructions. But will America attack? What kind of international support would they get? And might British troops be sucked into yet another conflict? This is the president at war. You've been very clear, Mr. President, turning to the question of Iraq, that uh, it's part of an axis of, of evil, as I think you, you called it. When you meet Tony Blair in the coming days, will you be discussing the possibility of an attack on Iraq? I'll be talking a lot of things about Iraq with him, starting with the fact that we both recognize uh, that Saddam Hussein is a dangerous man, and he harbors and develops weapons of mass destruction. Uh, make, no, make no mistake about it. Uh, that he has got uh, a variety of weapons that can harm mankind, and he's not afraid to use them, including on his own people. And so we'll be discussing that, and we'll be discussing all options. I have no immediate plans to conduct military operations, but as one of my closest friends, as personal friends uh, amongst the world leaders, and one of my nation's closest allies, of course, we're going to discuss all options. I take your point about no immediate plans, but. In a sense, have you made up your mind that Iraq must be attacked? I made up my mind that Saddam needs to go. That's about all I'm willing to share with you. And you will take action to make sure that happens. And of course, if, if the logic of the war on terror means anything, which you, you, you have explained, then Saddam must go. That's what I just said. The policy of my government is that he goes. People think that Saddam Hussein has, have, has had no, no links with the Al-Qaeda network and, and, and wondering why you have... Saddam was, the worst thing that could happen would be to allow a nation like Iraq, run by Saddam Hussein, to develop weapons of mass destruction and then team up with terrorist organizations so they can blackmail the world. I'm not going to let that happen. So you're going to go after him? 
As I told you, the policy of my government is that Saddam Hussein not be in power. Now, how do you plan to achieve this, Mr. President? Just wait and see. Do you think that the international coalition, which you, which, which an administration once assembled for the Gulf War when Kuwait was invaded, and the aggressors were undoubtedly the Iraqis, uh, do you think that that international coalition can be assembled again for another attack on Iraq? I think the uh, I think the coalition can be assembled to demand that Iraq let inspectors back in like she agreed to do right after the Gulf War. I wonder why the man won't let inspectors in. I think so, he's, he's probably got something to hide, don't you think? So, and the idea of having this man who is willing to murder his own people have weapons of mass destruction, I'm not going to let that happen, and neither will the free world. And I'm, so I'm confident that, uh, that uh, we can lead a coalition to pressure Saddam Hussein and to deal with Saddam Hussein. You say you, can, you are confident about this coalition. Certainly in Britain, there are grave misgivings ab about it. Um, Tony Blair is under pressure within his own party. 51% um, of the British people think, in an opinion poll, that Saddam Hussein should not be attacked at this time. How, how are you going to do that? How are you going to accomplish that? How am I going to change the minds of Britain? And, and well, what a, lot of, a, a number of European countries, too. Well, we'll just watch and see what happens. I, I want to work closely with our friends and consult with our friends, like I am doing. And uh, one thing Tony Blair does understand is that Saddam Hussein is a dangerous person. And I admire his courage for speaking the truth. And he speaks clearly about the truth. And that's one of the reasons why I, I, I like his advice and treasure his counsel. So what are you calling on Saddam Hussein to do is well, to firstly, let the inspectors back in. Yeah, of course. That's what he said and, he would do. And, and that's the way he can avoid. But this is not an issue of inspectors. This is an issue of him upholding his word that he would not develop weapons of mass destruction. So whether he allows the inspectors in or not, he is on the list to be attacked. He's the next target. And so you keep trying to put, you're one of these clever reporters that keeps trying to put words in my mouth. Far from me, and, Mr. President. Well, I'm afraid you did, sir. But nevertheless, you've had my answer on the subject. And uh, I have no plans to attack on my desk. A policy of my government is for Saddam not to be in office. It's in the interest of the free world that he not be in office. And it's in the interest of the free world that he not be allowed to develop weapons of mass destruction. And the first thing is he must show us whether or not he has weapons of mass destruction, just like he promised he would do. And you will have to build the job of the coalition to make sure that this... We've this got happens. a vast coalition for freedom right now. And I talk to leaders all the time, and of course the subject of Iraq, amongst other subjects, comes up. And I explain to them precisely what I'm explaining to you today. And most people understand that history has called us into action. History has given us an opportunity to fight for freedom. And we all will fight for freedom. Mr. President, thank you. Yes, sir. You're welcome. As our interview ended, but the I president announced that he wanted to show me around the White House, to tell me how he's adapted to the pressures of office, and how September the 11th has come to define his presidency. Mom. It's fantastic. Yeah, she's great lady. It's not true that I come down here every morning and speak to the portrait before I go to the Oval Office. The dogs and I will get out here about 6.50 every morning, I'm an early morning guy, and walk down this magnificent col uh, colonnade here. How do you, how do you cope with the pressures, Mr. President? How do you, how do you well, I'm a man, I, I'm in, I, I believe in prayer. I believe in exercise. Um, I've got a great wife who keeps, my, keeps me uh, balanced, as they say. She constantly uh, reminded me of, of uh, you know, what's important in life. We've got a fabulous team, put together one of the great administrations in American history, and it gives me great comfort to know that the advice I get is uh, honest, straightforward advice from very experienced people. Has anything surprised you about the, about the pressures, having these crises appearing in your desk day after day? Have there been any surprises since you you came to the Oval Office. You know, I, I think the surprise was how clearly I saw what we needed to do after 9-11. Uh, I, I shouldn't say surprise. I guess I was pleased with how clearly I saw what we needed to do. I, I, 
I was uh, obviously emotional, and uh, but I knew what the country needed to do, and I was really pleased with uh, with the way the country responded. How do you how do you think America has changed after those terrible events of September the 11th? Well, I think a lot of people are now taking an assessment of, uh, about what's important in life. You know, I hope mom and moms and dads are saying. You know, what can I do to be a better mother or father? Uh, I know a lot of my fellow Americans have asked, you know, what can we do to help fight on the war against terror? And I answer by saying, love somebody. Be a good neighbor. Help some kid who just wonders whether the American experience is meant for them. Teach somebody how to read. In other words, there's a lot of small acts that help define the face of America, which, um, which uh, really do contribute to standing up against evil. I mean, You've probably heard me speak. I truly believe that this is a fight against evil. Uh, these killers are evil people. They've hijacked a religion, and they want to commit murder in order to justify the 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 goals and the ambitions of a few people. And do, do, uh, do you do you, ever, do you understand that there are sort of different perceptions about this? For example. I heard after you made your latest speech about uh, about the, the, the crisis in the Middle East, a Palestinian spokesman said, said, yes, but we also live under the terrorism of occupation. Well, do you, do I, you, I do you understand, understand that? Sure, people have it, but I, you know, look, my job isn't to try to nuance. My job is to tell people what I think. And when I think there's an axis of evil, I say it. I think moral clarity is important if you believe in freedom. And, uh, you know, people can make all kinds of excuses, uh, but there are some truths involved. And one of the truths is they're sending suicide killers in because they hate Israel. That's the truth. And you can justify it any way you want, but nevertheless, the role of the president, as far as I'm concerned, is to stand up and tell the truth, and I did today. I made it as plain as I could. I try to speak as plainly as I can. I know people don't like it when I say there's evil, this is evil versus good, but I, that's not gonna stop me from saying what I think is right. I'm an optimist. As you can see, the way we've got the Oval Office here designed, it's open and it's, it's optimistic and it's, uh, it's sunny. Because that's what I feel about life. And uh, uh, I, 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 it was right in this room where Vladimir Putin came in. And, and I had a fantastic meeting with him here. It's, finally, we're getting rid of the Cold War where we hated each other. And, you know, it, 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 you've been sitting in the 50s saying, can you ever imagine the U.S. president and the Russian president sitting here and talking like friends? You just said, of course not. That's a, how far-fetched is that? That's what I use as an example today is what is possible in the Middle East. And I think it is possible. All of us are going to have to work to achieve that, though. Do you see who's sitting over there? That's a great war leader. Winston Churchill. It's a gift of the British government. On loan, I might add. I shouldn't say a gift. A loan of the British government. And he's here because the British ambassador knew uh, that Winston Churchill was one of my favorite uh, leaders of all time. And he had a wonderful sense of humor, great clarity of vision, was not afraid to speak the truth, and could lead. And spent a great deal of time right in, here in the, in the White that's House. That's exactly right. During the Second World War. And by the way, that's, that very desk was used by Franklin Roosevelt, the man who, who he came to visit. Sir. Thank yeah, you. thanks for coming. I'm real proud of this place. It's a, part of the, it's a shrine to our country. It's an honor to be here. God bless you. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. You bet. And as that was a change tonight, Savage Planet returns next Friday at the usual time, 10.30. Sunday night, a documentary about Mohammed Atta, the man who allegedly led the World Trade Center attack on September the 11th. Portrait of a terrorist, Sunday at 11.50. Starting with the earliest. We're putting these great shows in order of appearance. Aha! At 6.20, stars in their eyes. If your talent can fit into a singer's jeans, you're on. Blind date at 7.10. I don't think he ever washed and his breath smelled like a gorilla's armpit. Well done. And as more couples are quizzed for cash in Millionaire, Desert Nine meets the original pop idol. It can only be this man. Cliff Richard. Oh, was not nice? That's the complete lineup for Saturday night on ITV1.
One million pounds, 12 ordinary people, one extraordinary game. Survivor, 9.45 tonight on ITV1.